When you sit down for dinner, what you see before you is a plate of food. I'm going to talk about a big way of looking at that plate of food, a way that goes beyond the plate, beyond the recipe, and it's an approach whose aim is to stimulate national economies, to reclaim tradition and health, to empower chefs. It's the power of cuisine. I was born in New Zealand but had the very good luck to be raised in the Pacific Islands. I can't begin to describe the impact that had on me. It was like going from black and white to glorious colour. It was like the lights being flooded on. Particularly the market in Suva, Fiji had a huge effect on me. That's where I decided to become a chef. And you know, if you live in the Pacific, you never actually leave. So I was destined to take coconuts with me for the rest of my life. I ended up in New York and I worked for a large US restaurant group, putting restaurants together all over the country, New York, Las Vegas, and Miami. I also worked with community food programs. One in particular, I developed myself with a group of friends, and it was around collecting meals from New York City restaurants and delivering to the, uh, them to homeless people in the city subways. On one day, we would feed up to 2,000 people. I began to question the values of a food world, in fact, a whole world, where it was profit and non-profit, have, have not. It was very different from the value system I've been brought up with, within the Pacific, where food was for everyone. The restaurant satisfied my creativity, but the food programs fed my heart. In New York, I worked for an amazing woman called Mary Cleaver, and she was at the forefront of the local war movement, her catering company bought all their food from local farmers, often organic. And so from her, I learned all the values and practices of sustainable food systems. I took a job in the Caribbean, putting 21 restaurants into three resorts. And what I found really surprised me, all the food was being imported, yet I'd been to the market, I'd seen the farmers, there was fantastic local supply, what was the problem? So I set about creating uh, growing contracts so that the farmers could supply the hotels. I realized that the menus were the creative glue that joined tourism to agriculture. I really realized the power of being a chef because through my menus, I could leave a whole lot of money in, the, in small economies, island economies. It was very powerful. The menus were quite literally the business plan of the nation. So over the course of Three resorts in two years, there was a dramatic uptake in local supply. One thing kept coming up. The local chefs did not think their own food was good enough to go on the menu. I, I loved their food. I, I, I couldn't believe it, actually. But I knew that to get a whole swing of local agricultural supply into tourism, I had to encourage local cuisine. Oh, yeah. You see, when local food is in tourism, it, it creates a whole lot of opportunities for everyone in that country, from farmers to fishermen to restaurateurs to artisanal makers, cake makers, jelly people, everybody. I often think of Thailand and its wonderful street food. I see a very successful cuisine here because all of those vendors are micro-businesses, often family-based, and because they're Thai, they're Thai food, they reach into production and create a whole dynamic of culinary prosperity. I knew the same was true in the South Pacific, though. We hadn't put much of our food into tourism, with some notable exceptions. But Pacific cuisine was definitely not at the status of Thai or Italian or French. Part of it was our problem. I've been brought up there. I, knew that, I know that we think of the Pacific that overseas is better, including food. But tourism also had come on right after colonialism. And I think some of the slightly imperious psyche had lingered. Tourists came to the Pacific and thought they could ask for more of what they had at home, something they would never do if they went to Thailand or Italy or France. Worse, the Pacific had become the dumping grounds for low-quality fatty meats, lamb flaps, chicken backs, turkey tails. Don't they just sound delicious? <laughs> Nonetheless, the Pacific developed a fat tooth, an appreciation for these products, and it had been terrible for their health, and worse, these products had some to come what define Pacific food, but this was not truly Pacific food. The original Pacific food was based on superfoods, 
coconuts, fish, dynamic greens, complex carbs, fruit. My friend Kath Coe Dunsford, Kath Coe Dunsford calls, this, calls this food colonialism. I, I love that term. Nonetheless, in tourism, the Pacific moved its own food culture aside and put Western food on the menus. And then this tourism food was called by the traveling public Pacific Island food. What an insult. Just consider for a second the consequences of telling a whole region that their food isn't good enough for you. Food is what our mothers make us. It's what sustains us. It's core to our cultural sense of self. It is us. So to be told your food is not good enough, that's very destructive. Around this time, I was in Fiji and I met Tracy Berno, a tourism academic, and also Shiri Ram, an amazing photographer. And we thought if we get a great cookbook together about Pacific food, maybe the celebration will occur. We loved it and we wanted everyone else to. So I came back home. Of course, there was amazing, creative, exciting, dynamic food in Pacific Island homes. It just wasn't really in the resorts. Also, we've been told that no one in the Pacific is going to give you a recipe. People were hunting us down. There was also an organic revolution sweeping the Pacific. Now, so there was amazing product to work with. Now, organics in the Pacific is not just a health brand. It's a validation of traditional Polynesian and Melanesian farming methods. It's the same. And so organics validates and captures the integrity of the region, of the region's environmental purity. I also love the way that Pacific people shared food. In the Pacific, food creates relationships and communities. The story of the food is the story of the people, and this is a story whose time had truly come. I found incredible leadership in food. For example, in Samoa, there's an NGO called Women in Business Development, and they fostered in Samoa a thousand organic family farms, a thousand organic family farms in little Samoa. I'm so, I, I almost choke up when I think about it because the, that's, that's like world leadership. I was in New York a couple of weeks ago, and a friend of mine who's a GMO activist said to me that apparently, a group of women in Samoa have managed to do what world governments cannot. <laughs> There's also Sashi Karan of Friend Fiji, an amazing organization. You've probably seen their product in the airport in Nandi when you leave. And it's based on the beautiful Indo-Fijian recipes of chutneys and relishes and jams. And it's a micro-business network which provides income to families who were hit by the failure of sugarcane in Fiji. Then there's my good friend and, and personal mentor, Suliana Siwatimbao in Fiji also. Suliana is saving Pacific heritage crops. She's an expert on Pacific traditional healing. So she understands when you lose a crop, you don't just lose the food, you lose the wisdom of that crop, the traditional healing wisdom. You lose culture. I realized these women weren't just creating food systems, they were creating a whole way to live on the planet. And there were many more in Tonga and Vanuatu as well, in the Cook Islands. Imagine wrapping all of this into tourism. So this is what emerged for me. I began to see the cuisine, when, when correctly conceived of and developed, is the driver of so very much. For example, this is a project I'm working on in Samoa right now. If organic Samoan cuisine, authentic Samoan cuisine, based on organics, is dro dropped into tourism, it supports the environment because organic farmers look after the earth. Food security, organic supply penetrates local markets. The chefs get to cook from the heart, their soul food, finally. National economy, less food is imported. Tourism brand, a uniquely Samoan tourism brand that is a source of industry and pride, and more and more. I realized that cuisine was a development tool, if seen that way. And I wrote all the thinking into Mayor Kai as I went. So six countries, about three and a half thousand coconuts, and two years later I was finished. In the process, the recession had hammered the US. I lost my home, my business. I actually lost everything. It was, it was pretty hard. 
And I could have gone back to save it, but I, I'd begun making decisions based on what will I be happiest with on the day that I die, and it was always the book. I also felt that it was such a small thing to give back to the community that had just given me so very much. Yeah, so the week that the book was launched, I had 40 bucks in my bank account. I was broke and broken. I went home to my parents, who thankfully have always believed in me and, and believed in what I was doing. And then a miracle happened. Merkai was nominated for the largest book award in the food world, the Gourmand Award in Paris. It's the, it's the food equivalent, the cookbook equivalent of a Pulitzer. Our competition was the New York Times, I assume you've heard of them, the New York Times Essential Cookbook, and Noma. And Noma, the day before, had been named by Michelin the best restaurant in the world. I was pretty embarrassed to be there, actually. <laughs> and, you know, it just seemed preposterous. This little book from the Pacific, what were we doing there? It just, it just seemed incredible. But we won. still very close to my heart. And in one spectacular moment, Pacific Island cuisine took its rightful place next to the great cuisines of the world. We were unprepared for the pride that swept the region. It was amazing to us, and it was fantastic to see people we'd written about have a raise in their profile. We knew by now we were as much a community as a cookbook and a community very proud of its food. The Cordon Bleu named me their chef ambassador for New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. And this was very important to me because it gave me authority. Authority to say, if it's good enough for the Cordon Bleu, it's good enough for the menu. <laughs> I say that a lot. <laughs> True Pacific was formed at this time, which you've probably heard of them. They're a grouping of Pacific Island food producers looking to penetrate the New Zealand and international markets. So Merkai's win was just wonderful for them. Pacific Island cuisine was hot. But what I most learned was that the media is a powerful development tool. The power of cuisine model had been so dynamic and successful as a book, we made a television series. And the television series goes through six Pacific countries creating Cuisine Ambassadors, as we go, it's called Real Pacific. It's going to 80 countries this year. It's going to be in New Zealand on TV1 in September. <laughs> Thank you. I've never heard of television been used as a development tool before, but that's exactly what the show is. It's so exciting. I also learned that books form the foundation and authority on which to base other actions. That's the cover of my new book, it's coming out soon, and it's a dedicated book for Samoa. It's, it reads like a destination book, but it's designed to create Samoa's own sustainable tourism industry. And when you see how beautiful real Samoan food is, you'll just wonder why it was ever moved out of tourism. You can apply this to business. On the left, that's a conventional business plan. You see above that plate? And that's the regular business plan where financial profit is the, is the desired effect, the desired outcome. But on the right, in the power of cuisine model, you could put profits of culture, trade, nutrition, community, same plate, different approach. Which one would you choose? I realized this was a way of thinking. And I realized this was a Pacific way of thinking. If you've ever been to Samoa, you would have heard the term fa'a Samoa and it means the Samoan way, but it means more. It means reaching past the self into the community and across generations. I guess you could say it's an indigenous way of thinking. I learned it in the Pacific, and I learned it from my parents, who are here somewhere. I'm really thrilled to see it emerging in social business models um, being developed by the B team, Derek Hanley and Richard Branson. It's a business approach that works with the power of love rather than the love of power. And it's a way of thinking that's alive and well in the beautiful islands of the South Pacific. Thank you.